Stoicism became the most widespread and successful philosophy in the Roman Empire because it promised a sense of peace of mind in a complex and turbulent world that, as today, seemed dangerous and uncontrollable. But Stoicism was not the only philosophy that promised peace and tranquility to its adherents. The Epicureans in honor of the founder of the school of Epicurus I spoke about the same thing. Like his predecessors, the Greek philosophers, both the Stoics and Epicureans sought eudaimonia, or lasting happiness. In some areas the views of the Epicureans and the Stoics coincided, but in general, it is impossible to reconcile these two schools. The differences between them are too great. In the first 30 letters to Lucilius, Seneca quotes a statement from Epicurus at the end of each letter. These sayings or epigrams exactly coincide with the teachings of the Stoics on such issues as the importance of frugal living and achieving wealth through economy. By placing Epicurus in the opposite camp, Seneca was extremely objective and recognized the value of true wisdom regardless of its source. He often repeated to his friend Lucilius that good ideas are the common property of humanity, no matter who expresses them. Widespread stereotypes and the development of language did a disservice to the Epicureans, as well as to the Stoics. Today we call an Epicurean a person who strives for pleasure, like a gourmet to exquisite dishes. It is true that the Epicureans made pleasure the basis and goal of their philosophy, but they were not hedonists. In fact, by pleasure they meant a life free from suffering. As for gourmet food, it's exactly the opposite. Epicurus himself ate mainly bread and water, and when he added cheese to his diet, he considered it a luxury. Both the Stoics and the Epicureans sought peace and tranquility for the soul, but their views on the universe were exactly the opposite. The Stoics likened it to an intelligent organism, just as your hand is a manifestation of biological intelligence. In contrast, the Epicureans believed that the universe was made of atoms, tiny particles of matter that collide and combine in random. The key words here are arbitrary and random. While a curious idea, atomism does not explain the orderliness and patterns that we observe in nature or biological life, which are very far from random. Another significant difference between the two schools is found in their ideas about how people should participate in society. When Epicurus founded his school of philosophy in Athens, he bought a plot of land outside the city and named it the Garden. Epicurus's disciples spent time in the Garden, which resembled a hippie commune. The Epicureans led a common life but placed themselves outside of society. The goal was to achieve serenity of spirit, but in practice this meant giving up everything that could disturb the soul, including the possible disappointments associated with marriage, raising children, and participating in politics. The quintessence of the desire to separate from society can be the famous advice of Epicurus, live inconspicuously. For the Stoics, the Epicurean culture of non-participation raised a number of serious ethical questions and was also the subject of ridicule. The moral teachings of Epictetus, who had a sharp tongue, are still understandable today. For example, from an address to a student, Tell me, for God's sake, do you imagine a city of Epicureans? I'm not getting married. Me neither. After all, you shouldn't get married. But one should not give birth to children. But one should not participate in government affairs. What will happen? Where will the citizens come from? Who will raise them? Unlike the Epicureans, the Stoics emphasize the importance of participating in the affairs of society, realizing that by nature we are social animals. From the Stoic point of view, we simultaneously belong to two different cities, or two different communities. The first association is the city or settlement where we were born. The second association is the cosmopolis, the world city or cosmic community, which includes the whole world and all humanity. The brotherhood of all people to which we belong, the Stoics said, obliges us to improve society, not to leave it by joining a commune, but to actively participate in the affairs of local communities and the entire state. This is why many Stoics, including Seneca and Marcus Aurelius, were politicians or civil servants of the Roman Empire. Stoicism encouraged them to make every effort to improve people's lives. For Stoics, living in harmony with oneself means participating in society in order to benefit others. But everyone is different, and serving your community can take many forms. We were not made from one mold, 
and so the first step is to understand yourself and your unique personality. Know yourself. Everyone creates his own morals. Chance dictates his occupation. Seneca. Moral Letters to Lucilius. In ancient Greece, the famous phrase Know Thyself was carved on the wall of the Temple of Apollo at Delphi. This advice applies to all aspects of life, but it is most relevant when trying to answer the question, how can I live in harmony with myself and contribute to society? Every person is different, and everyone has the most suitable occupation and profession. Added to this is the factor of chance, or fortune. As Seneca explained, we are responsible for the qualities of our character, but a person cannot always choose how to earn a living. While we may not have complete control over our professional careers and life achievements, we should certainly strive to be the best we can be, that is, do what suits us best. Therefore, Seneca writes that we must first examine ourselves, and then think about what to do in life. You should examine yourself carefully, he advises, because people often overestimate their capabilities. Of course, the opposite is also true. Sometimes people achieve less than they can because they doubt their abilities. In discussing these aspects, Seneca seems to follow the ideas of his predecessor, the Roman Stoic philosopher Panaetius. In his works, Panaetius described the four roles that determine a person's place in society, which included work and career. We will not call them roles, but factors. The first factor that affects us is our universal nature as human beings. For a Stoic, this means that we are rational beings, capable of understanding the world and acting in the best way possible. The second factor is the qualities that nature gives us as individuals, and these qualities can be very different. As Seneca noted, what is inherent in us from birth remains for life. People differ significantly from each other in appearance. For example, some are naturally muscular, others are not. But the psychological attitudes, personality traits, and talents that we all possess are even more different. As Seneca noted, The timidity of some is of little use for public affairs that require an impressive appearance. The persistence of others is unnecessary when running a household. Some, having power, do not give in to anger, while others are driven by indignation to all sorts of rash words. Some do not know how to maintain good manners, and do not refrain from caustic witticisms. For all of them, rest is more beneficial than work. People who are by nature unbridled and lack self-control must avoid everything that leads to independence which can cause harm. The third factor besides understanding the characteristics of our personality and capabilities is a case beyond our control. For example, we are influenced by our upbringing, the material well-being our parents, good or bad teachers, and much more. The fourth and final factor is our own will or personal subjectivity, our intentions and decisions, the choices we make about what we put our energy into, and the energy with which we carry out our intentions all have a profound impact on our careers and contributions to society. According to the Stoics, we must know ourselves so as not to go against nature by trying to do something that is beyond our capabilities. It is impossible to live in harmony with yourself without knowing who you are. Finally, it is impossible to live in harmony with yourself or be happy by trying to imitate someone else and ignoring your own nature. As we can see, the Roman Stoics emphasized our universal nature as human being, that which we all have in common. However, they also recognized the importance of individual character traits, which are also given to us by nature. For a happy and fulfilling life in society, both of these aspects must be taken into account. Thus, the Stoics expanded the idea of following nature by extending it to the characteristics of our personality. Constancy. Take care most of all to be true to yourself. For Seneca, living in harmony with oneself means being one unchanging, whole person. Without a personal sense of self, a person's intentions are like the fickle wind. But I don't say, explains Seneca, that a wise man should always walk at the same pace, as long as he walks along the same road. This idea echoes Seneca's metaphor when he says that when traveling it is important to have a goal and not to wander randomly. Consistency and having a purpose are a byproduct of a true philosophy of life. A complete person is one person, not several, has a goal in life and corresponding aspirations. 
but many people don't know what they really want until the very last moment. As Seneca put it, many are not guided by intentions, but act on the fly. In another of his works, he illustrates this idea with an amusing story about behavior that is now called neurotic. There is no one who does not change his plans and desires from day to day. Now he wants to have a wife. Now he wants to have a mistress. Sometimes they dream of reigning. Sometimes they try to be more obliging than a slave. Sometimes they inflate to the point that everyone hates them. Then they shrink and become lower than those lying on the ground. This exposes the recklessness of the soul. Every time it is different, unlike itself. And in my opinion, there is nothing more shameful. Believe me, it's a great thing to always play one role, but no one except the sage does this. All others have many faces. Sometimes we will seem to you thrifty and sedate, sometimes wasteful and vain. Every now and then we change our disguises and take on the opposite one to the one we discarded. So demand one thing from yourself, as you showed yourself at the beginning, remain so until the end. One of the signs of good morals is that people are satisfied with themselves and do not change. Malice is fickle. It changes often, but never for the better. Therefore, Seneca advises Lucilius, choose once and for all the standard of life and straighten it according to it. Another way to be true to yourself and consistent is to present yourself to the world as you truly are. Seneca writes about how people wear a mask and pretend in public. We behave differently in front of an audience than we do in private. This often results in some pomposity and boasting. The problem is that a person who creates a false image for the public is always worried that his falsehood will be discovered. This may be shocking to some, as is the case with photographs of famous Hollywood actresses without makeup. As Seneca notes, the life of those who constantly wear a mask is neither serene nor joyless, and it is better to be despised because of simplicity than to suffer torment because of constant pretense. And finally, an indispensable condition for agreement with oneself is the coincidence of words and actions. In modern language, back up your words with action or to the doctor, heal yourself. Seneca criticized philosophers who did not adhere to this rule. Philosophy is not a show fit for display to the crowd. One must be a philosopher not in words, but in deeds. In other words, let our highest goal be one thing, to speak as we feel and to live as we speak. He has fulfilled his promise, who is the same whether you listen to him or look at him. Intellectual freedom. The main thing for us is not to be like sheep who always run after the herd. Seneca, about a blessed life. For Seneca, one of the ways to live in harmony with oneself is to take care of maintaining intellectual freedom. This quality placed him among the best thinkers of his time. It also makes it surprisingly modern. Today, declaring one's intellectual freedom sounds like a challenge or arrogance to many people, but Seneca's approach was different. He associated intellectual freedom with modesty. In other words, he recognized the limitations and incompleteness of human knowledge. He understood that in a few centuries new discoveries would lead to a deeper understanding of our world and the entire universe. Scientific knowledge does not stand still, and we must be open to everything new. Moreover, through critical thinking we ourselves can contribute to the advancement of human knowledge. He notes that we in future eras will multiply what was received from those who lived before us. Here, for example, is what he writes about scientific discoveries. The time will come when the diligence of long generations will one day bring to light everything that is now hidden from us. For such a study, one life is not enough, even if all of it is dedicated to heaven. But the time will come, and our descendants will be surprised that we did not know such simple things. In his figurative expression, the thinkers of the past opened the approaches to future discoveries and did not exhaust the possibilities of human knowledge. According to Seneca, this applies to Stoicism and not just to astronomy and other sciences. Stoicism is a philosophy, not a religion, and is based on evidence, not faith. If you find Stoicism's arguments compelling and find ways to test them, you may also find it useful as a philosophy of life. A true Stoic will not ask you to accept anything on faith. Perhaps this is one of the reasons why Stoicism appeals to many modern people who consider themselves non-religious humanists. 
It is not surprising that Seneca, being an independent thinker, sometimes criticized the early Stoics. For example, he pointed out the inconsistency of some of the arguments of Zeno, the founder of the school. He also did not hesitate to criticize the logic of Chrysippus, one of the most influential of the early Stoics, as too abstract and lacking force. Seneca believed that a philosopher needs not only faith, but also critical thinking. For the most part, agreeing with the early Stoics, he reserved the right to criticize them. No, but I allow myself to invent something, and change it and discard it. I am not a slave to my predecessors, but a like-minded person. Few people know this, but Seneca actually significantly developed the philosophy of Stoicism. He brought to it his deep understanding of human psychology and human motivation. The early Stoics understood that false beliefs can cause suffering, but Seneca was the first to explain, in great detail, how these false beliefs are acquired through the process of socialization and adaptation to social norms. In the following memorable passage, Seneca talks about following the path of his predecessors, while at the same time remaining open to new knowledge. No, I'll use the old road, but if I find another, shorter, and smoother one, I'll pave it myself. Everyone who did the same thing before us is not our overlords, but our leaders. The truth is open to everyone. No one has taken possession of it. A considerable share of it will remain for our descendants.